Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth is Making a Comeback, a production of LibertyNation.com. I'm Lisa K. Donner. On today's episode, are we looking at a grand sedition or is this just more of the same from former FBI officials Strzok and Page? Dems and Doe, who raised the most and does it really matter anymore? All hell's breaking loose in the socialist mess of Venezuela and finally, why God and guns go together now more than ever. All this and more on Liberty Nation's TV news magazine. Stay tuned. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Lindsey Graham read aloud a series of text messages between former FBI agent Peter Strzok and Lisa Page during a hearing with Attorney General William Barr last week. Put together, these messages pack a real political punch. Let's listen. We know that the person in charge of investigating hated Trump's guts. I don't know how Mr. Mueller felt about Trump, but I don't think anybody on our side believes that he had a personal animosity toward the president to the point he couldn't do his job. This is what Strzok said on February 12, 2016. Now, he's in charge of the Clinton email investigation. Oh, he's Trump's abysmal. I keep hoping the charade will end and people will just dump him. February 12, 2016. Page is the uh, Department of Justice lawyer assigned to this case. March 3rd, 2016. God, Trump is a loathsome human being. Struck. Oh, my God. Trump's an idiot. Page, he's awful. Struck. God, Hillary, should win 100 million to nothing. Compare those two people to Mueller. March 16th, 2016. I cannot believe Trump is likely to be an actual serious candidate for president. July the 21st, 2016. Trump is a disaster. I have no idea how destabilizing his presidency would be. August the 8th, 2016. Three days before Strzok was made deputy acting uh, in charge of the counterintelligence division of the FBI. He's never going to become president, right? Page to Strzok. No, no, he won't. We'll stop him. These are the people investigating the Clinton email situation and start the counterintelligence investigation of the Trump campaign. Compare them to Mueller. August the 15th, 2016. Struck. I want to believe the path you threw out for consideration in Andy's office, that there's no way he gets elected, but I'm afraid we can't take that risk. It's like an insurance policy in the unlikely event you die before you're 40. August 26, 2016. Just went to the Southern Virginia Walmart. I could smell the Trump support. October the 19th, 2016. Trump is a idiot. He's unable to provide a coherent answer. Sorry to the kids out there. These are the people that made a decision that Clinton didn't do anything wrong and a counterintelligence investigation of the Trump campaign was warranted. By now, we're all too familiar with the FBI's infamous power couple. The text messages between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page offered a glimpse into the heart of the deep state. The most recent text dump has to do with Vice President Mike Pence. Messages between Page, Strzok, and other senior officials at the Bureau appear to signal some kind of attempt to infiltrate the transition team of then incoming Vice President Pence. They discussed feeling out members of the Pence team and developing potential relationships. Here are just a few of their texts. Think he has any idea what he's doing from one day to the next? Re your email, redacted, no, redacted, brief Pence, right? Just so there are no surprises. I don't know if they would recall who did, but they know we sent someone. I spoke to Redacted about it. We both think there's no such action for us to take. Re above re email, it might be more important for Redacted to know that Redacted brief Pence, no? I think that's a good idea. So what does all this mean and where does it lead? 
Joining me now is Graham J. Noble, chief political correspondent. Hi, Lisa. All right. So Philip Bump wrote in the Washington Post that the latest news about Peter Strzok and Lisa Page's text messages are an interesting example of how Fox News's opinion side drags the network's reporting further to the right. Are we in a situation where it's time to just kill the messenger? It's funny that uh, the interpretation of these um, the text messages, which of course are just a small part of this entire story about how the FBI uh, treated the Trump campaign, the whole thing is so uh, overshadowed by by the politics of it, of course, and each side pointing fingers at the other for distorting the truth. Uh, so. <laughs> Of course, that's something that's never going to be resolved entirely. There's always going to be those two sides to this story. The evidence that no one seems to want to discuss are the actual texts from Strzok and Page. Any way you look at them, Graham, and it does appear that these two were trying to work Vice President Pence over, doesn't it? Uh, indeed it does, Lisa. And, uh, you know, I must admit, as, as someone who has actually read um, all of the Strzok page text messages that have been uh, so far released publicly. Um, I have uh, attempted to approach them and interpret them with something of an open mind. And, and I've attempted, if it's possible at all, to give these two former FBI officials the benefit of the doubt. But this particular exchange that I wrote about recently uh, does seem, for want of a better word, uh, incriminating. So what they have to say is pretty damning, and yet WAPO went through it, uh, went through basically hoops to try to explain that this did not mean what essentially anybody with common sense thinks it means. So what do you make of it? Well, in this particular case, and, and once again, I, I would I would say that I have I've attempted to look at all of the stock page text messages in a very fair manner, and I've I've, I've attempted to uh, to not uh, kind of jump on any bandwagons, as it was, in terms of accusing these these individuals of, of anything in particular. Although there are certain messages that just stand out, and and it's it's you know they're not really open to interpretation it it is what it is uh, and and these messages particularly do seem that they are not simply preparing a routine intelligence briefing for the incoming vice president's team um it definitely seems to be that they are uh, attempting to figure out how they can use the occasion of that briefing to uh, well, to essentially figure out a way to infiltrate, for want of a better term, the vice president's team. These two, Strzok and Page, seem like two people that just can't stop themselves. They uh, sound rather hostile to Donald Trump and his campaign, as we just heard in Lindsey Graham's remarks and his administration. I just don't see that there's any way around that, Graham. Is there really? Uh, no, there isn't really, and 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 the thing is, what what like what the entire situation comes down to, uh, beyond this particular incident with the briefing of the uh, the Pence team, what it comes down to is that they insist that their um, hostility towards the president w was actually um, overblown, and in fact, that what they were most concerned about was potential. Uh, coordination with the Russians on the part of at least someone in the Trump team. And of course, the, the one thing that blows that whole little uh, narrative out of the water is the fact that, that, that at no time did the FBI ever approach the Trump campaign and express their concerns, which is something that they would really have done um, if, if they genuinely were concerned that, that someone in Trump's orbit was coordinating with a foreign power. All right, so you use the words grand sedition in your article. Other people have used the word soft coup. Uh, do you think this is going too far to say that? I mean, do you think we uh, are starting to see evidence of that? 
Uh, I, I don't think it's going too far at all. I, I think I, I think either term is actually quite appropriate. I mean, you, we we call we, you know we we've often referred in history to the to the terms soft coup or bloodless coup, if you like, one that involved uh, overthrowing a legitimate government um, without actually using the military to do it. Um, and uh, of course, I use the term sedition, and I, I I think that term is particularly appropriate because if you actually look at the the definition of sedition or seditious conspiracy as it's laid out in the US code, it does appear very much that what these uh, FBI officials and probably some DOJ officials with them and others, including possibly the uh, former director of national intelligence, former head of the CIA, um, it does seem that all of these people were involved in a seditious conspiracy. Well, that brings up a good point. What do you make of Clapper and Brennan's involvement and references to uh, Trump and his campaign? Uh, or, or do you find that still to be sort of a gray area, Graham? I think we uh, have yet to find out the extent of their involvement. Um, I'm, I really do suspect that both of those individuals were much more heavily involved in this than 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 what we knew up until now uh we do know that there was a lot of uh a lot of connecting threads between the uh the fbi agents and other fbi officials who were involved in the investigation or the counterintelligence operation uh which targeted uh trump campaign individuals uh, we, uh, and uh, you know there were connections back to the back to the CIA there we know that we know that the CIA probably had its fingers all over the uh, so-called steel dossier uh, more than we um, have learned so far so I think when uh, things like the inspector general's report comes out uh, Michael Horowitz uh, his his report on uh, possible Pfizer abuse is, is due out the middle of uh, middle of this year and possibly what uh, AG Barr might turn up. Um, I think we have yet to learn more about the involvement of, certainly of John Brennan and possibly also of uh, James Clapper. Well, I, I was just going to bring up the Inspector General's report. At some point, uh, somebody's got to be in trouble here. Which one of these two do you think is going to sing? Uh, well, that's a tough question because, unfortunately, I believe that these kind of people, uh, Brennan, Clapper, uh, they, I, I think they believe, truly believe, that they are above the law and are, are, are basically untouchable. So I'm not sure that anyone is actually going to sing, but I think, I think certainly uh, um, there's going to be a preponderance of evidence uh, that ends up incriminating uh, one or both of those uh, gentlemen. Uh, well, let me just um, interrupt you for one sec. Uh, what I was really talking about was between Strzok and Page. And I personally think that Page is going to sing because Strzok, uh, when he gave his testimony, was quite haughty and arrogant. At least that's how he seemed. Uh, yes, I uh, absolutely agree. And I, and I think um, that probably uh, all of the members of Congress who were involved in the hearings with both Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, I think they would also uh, agree that of the two of them, uh, the latter, Lisa Page, the former FBI attorney, was uh, far more cooperative, uh, if you like, and far more perhaps, maybe this is the wrong word, but far more humble perhaps in, in the way that she approached the hearings where of course Peter Strzok was just the the very personification of of arrogance um, and so yes if either of the two uh, were going to be forthcoming with any more uh, incriminating material I think it's going to be uh, Lisa Page. Well this is going to be fascinating to watch as it develops. I think that uh, there is a problem in the media and that is the lack of coverage on this story. And that's why I really appreciate your reporting on this. Graham J. Noble, Chief Political Correspondent of LibertyNation.com. Thanks so much for joining us today, Graham. Thank you, Lisa.
With Vice President Joe Biden now in the race for the White House, the Democratic conga line grows ever longer. What will ultimately separate the men from the boys or the ladies from the girls? Well, that's actually likely to be money. And so far, Biden has demonstrated his strength in that area and put up some notable numbers. Liberty Nation's national columnist Sarah Cowgill recently explained, quote, Biden's foray into the financial race has so far been impressive, unquote. In a very short time, he has eclipsed the field of 20 candidates. Sarah joins us now to discuss the Democrats and their dough. Sarah, welcome to Truth TV. Hey, thanks for having me, Lisa. Always a pleasure. All right, so you were the most popular person on Truth TV last week. So you're back by popular demand. Oh, well, good. Mean girl pays off these days, huh? It does indeed. All right, so Biden hasn't been in the race officially for very long, but his finances are looking pretty darn good compared to the other Democrats. Uh, why do you think that is? Name recognition, just right off the bat, name recognition. Um, I, I, I can't think of much else. Um, and, and also that Bernie Sanders is a little bit too far left for the rest of the world. So I think it's just a slam dunk that right now Biden is going to be ahead. Let's look back at uh, the spending with Hillary and Donald Trump. So we look at this chart and we see that Hillary raised 1.191 million and Mr. Trump raised uh, essentially 646.8 million. Now, this is very unusual because generally the one with the most money usually wins. But this is a situation where things ha were turned basically upside down, right. isn't it? Absolutely, and, and I think it turned upside down because there was no message from, from the Democrats. There was no message whatsoever. Trump had the message. Do you really think it was just as simple as that, Sarah? I think it so it was as simple as that. I think the, the middle of America finally found somebody that spoke to them that said, let's make America great again. And all the nonsense stopped. They just, they're still behind him on that message. And I think that just flipped Hillary. She had nothing. I'm with her. What the heck does that mean? All right, this sort of belies the whole uh, collusion, Russian conspiracy, doesn't it? Because the business of spending money to elect Donald Trump seems rather silly when you look at the fact that Hillary had so much more money and she outspent him. She actually spent $969 million to Trump's $531 million spent. Right. Right. She, um, I think that the narrative is, you know, we're packing or Trump is packing uh, massive amounts of people at these venues. And that's not a Russian thing. They, they didn't sell the tickets. They didn't buy the tickets and hand them out to people. This is a Trump thing. This is a Trump following kind of thing. So Hillary was lost before she even started. Let's take a moment to look at this next graph. We see that the 2020 election is shaping up to be a very, very expensive run. What are some of the things you notice on this? Um, well, it'll be a $2 billion race right off the bat. That's an easy predictor. Um, I think you see Sanders and Biden kind of neck and neck fighting it out for who's going to be next in line. But again, if 2016 is any indication, I don't think it's going to matter. I think the guy with the best message that can reach, you know, the American populace is going to win. So, so this graph doesn't actually have Biden on it, but what uh, did Biden raise and how long did it take him? In 12 hours, he surpassed uh, Bernie's first 12 hours, or Bernie's complete. I mean, it, it, it was just an amazing thing. In 12 hours, he reached the threshold of 65,000 people um, to, to go ahead and, and be on the Democratic primary stage. You have to have 65,000 donors, according to DNC. They have some pretty tight rules on this. So he, he had that sewn up in 12 hours where everybody else is just kind of plodding along. Well, I think that's very interesting. Nobody's noticed this, but people who have been in politics before know that everybody looks at the quarterly fundraising totals. Do you think that uh, Biden didn't get in until after this fundraising total was set for a reason? Ooh, I don't know, conspiracy theory, maybe. 
You know, maybe he's sniffing around out there and trying to drum up some corporate dollars without anybody really paying attention. I, I, I don't know. Well, my thinking is that he wanted to see who his biggest competition was, which is fair. Uh, so why not see where the first quarter kind of pans out and then he can see what hoop he has to jump through. It sort of makes sense. Could be. I mean, he's, he's not the dumbest guy in the field. He's just the handsiest. But, I mean, let's face it, he's been through this before a lot of times. And with Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012, I mean, he's, he's a seasoned politician. But he is an old white man and an old guard Democrat. Biden essentially represents everything that progressives claim to hate. What do you think uh, the fact that Biden is outpacing his more progressive opponents says about the so-called progressive wing of the Democratic Party? Progressives get all of the media attention. They're the shiny object. Biden jumps in, people are looking at him like, is he gonna go to the left? Is he gonna spout Green New Deal? Is he gonna allow illegals to vote? You know, they're, they're waiting for him to be the voice of reason since he is the old guard. And I think that the Americans who might be swayed to vote for Joe Biden see that. They see him as an adult in, a, in the field of all the, uh, the lunacy that's going on. But how are the candidates themselves reacting to being outpaced so quickly by uh, Joe Biden's campaign and the donors? Oh, they're losing their minds. They're losing their mind. I've gotten seven emails, <laughs> but I don't know why I'm even on the list. I've gotten seven emails from Beto. And every day it's a different line in the, in the subject line. It's a different, you know, apocalypse now message about I need money, I need money, I need money. And, and, and Bernie's starting to stand out and, you know, decry what's going on. And, and, and he's kind of losing his mind over the firefighters union endorsing Biden. So they're, they're not happy and they're on the run. You mentioned earlier that the Democrats have set a bar of 65,000 individual donors to get on the stage. Who do you expect to see on the main debate stage, Sarah? Um, well, right off the bat, some several people have, well, there's another thing that goes with that 65,000 individual donors. It's they have to at least rank 1% in the polls and those polls are decided. It's not just, oh, Rasmussen reports this week, or uh, it's 538, or real clear pro politics. It's going to be what the Democrats decide they want the polls to be. So they could come up with their own little, hmm, this week, let's hand it to Kamala Harris. You know, and if, sh if they're not, you know, if they're not polling as strongly as she is in some of the other polls, they will use those polls. So it's, it's, they're tightly controlling this primary. It may look like a free-for-all, but the Democrats are tightly controlling this primary. Well, liberals always seem to want to control everything. So, so they got their hands on the trigger of this. And I think if people think that they don't, they're not, and that they're not tipping the scales, they're badly fooling themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, I picked out this last graph because I thought it was very interesting. Here we are in 2019. But let's go back to 1960, Kennedy Nixon. So what I see is that it's gotten really out of hand. I mean, it's astronomical. Oh, of course it's crazy, Tim. Right. Crazy. But then in 2016, the money didn't seem to matter as much. So what do you make of this graph? Um, it's obviously there's inflation. <laughs> it happens across the board, even in political candidacies, but you've got a fight on your hands. You've got too many media outlets. You've got 24 seven news coverage. People have to buy heavily. And that's probably, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say where the most media or the most money is going to purchase media. And so look at all of your 24 hour news, cable news stations, look at social media, Facebook, you've got Instagram, you have Twitter. So there's a lot of money going into play where there didn't used to be. And that's even true for 2008 and 2012. So it's dropped off a little bit, but you're going to have, I mean, the Obama uh, races were huge. They were huge financial juggernauts. Um, and then Hillary's was pretty good too, but it's dropping back a little bit because I do think there's other media outlets popping in that are leveling the playing field a little bit.
It's also interesting to see that in 2008, uh, Obama outpaced McCain three to one. McCain was not a likable, he was not a likable candidate. And the Democrats did a great job of just smearing him. He wasn't gonna get a lot of love. But then uh, if you look in 2012, Romney picked up the pace a lot with a lot more money than McCain, but it didn't really help him in the end. No, it didn't, because he's unlikable. Hillary was unlikable, so it doesn't help if nobody likes you. It doesn't matter how much money you have. So in the end, all and be all uh, is not the money then. It is not the money. Not anymore. It's the message. Well, thanks so much. Sarah Cowgill, national correspondent for LaRainNation.com. Thanks so much for analyzing this and for your significant political background uh, in campaigns. The situation in Venezuela is spiraling out of control, and it does seem a coup or change in leadership is imminent. Meanwhile, there are outside forces at work in toppling or propping up the Maduro regime. The obvious suspects, Russia, Cuba, China, taking the pro-Maduro stance, the U.S. and many others hoping, praying, and perhaps doing a little bit more to topple Maduro. Once again, thousands of citizens have taken to the streets in what can only be termed a very volatile situation. Joining me now to discuss the changing situation in Venezuela is Liberty Nation's managing editor, Mark Angelides. Hi, Lisa. Good, good to see you. All right, first off, how is the whole thing playing in the UK? In the UK, there's, there's quite a lot of interest, uh, specifically because our, our leading party leaders, uh, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn, have both expressed uh, an interest in the Venezuela situation. Um, Theresa May, from a, a Five Eyes security point of view, uh, obviously for the cooperation we have with uh, the US, Australia, Canada, etc., uh, and Jeremy Corbyn, because Venezuela was his uh, socialist uh, model. He was a big supporter of Chavez and uh, seems to think the Maduro regime is doing well. Uh, well, he's in direct contrast with the people of Venezuela. May Day in Caracas, and the opposition leadership called its supporters out on the streets again. So as we look at this footage of the May Day protests and uh, more that have been happening recently, what do you think of the situation there? What we have sacrificed will not be in vain. Well, so far that there hasn't been too much violence. You'd expect a fair bit because this is essentially, it's a soft coup. It's something that we, we haven't really seen before. We've seen a lot of strong military coups before, but, but a soft coup, not so much. So th there, are, there have been uh, episodes of violence. Um, there've been some shootings. There were protests in other cities too. Whether that's uh, just soft bullets or, or actual bullets, we're not sure yet. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a big sea change happening there. Right, so what you have is a situation where the people of Venezuela are rising up as well they should. Yeah, pretty much the, um, this has been going on all, almost since 2013 when Maduro was first elected. It, it was called out as illegitimate at the time. And legitimacy is really the, the key thing for a president. So if they're in place, um, they are legitimate because they're in place. And whether they got there legitimately or not, uh, becomes a different thing. But um, with Guardo being uh, the interim president and having such international support, it's difficult to see how Maduro can, short of going full dictator, and more so than, than he is now, I, I don't see how he can hang on. So last week, my, Mike Pompeo and uh, Mike Pence both said, uh, quote, we're with the people of Venezuela. Trump was, of course, uh, naturally a little more circumspect. Uh, what did he have to say? So Trump uh, mentioned not quite as strongly for the support that uh, he was with the people of Venezuela and with democracy, whereas uh, Pompeo, Pence uh, and Bolton were all very much backing the, um, the Operation Liberty, as uh, Guardo's called it. They, they were very much, we are behind you on this. I think obviously uh, Donald Trump has to be a little more circumspect on that. 
So, so the U.S. and some 50 countries already recognize Guardo as Venezuela's president. And sanctions have been imposed against the Maduro government. They're basically trying to speed things up. So what's the international feeling on this? Well, the international feel is really that um, what's, the, uh, what's happening with the other countries giving support, that's a pretty important thing. Because what it shows the actual people on the ground, the, the millions of people who are still left in Venezuela, by the way. Remember, we, they've lost about five million people fleeing uh, west and south to Cambodia and, and Brazil. Um, but this shows the people who are left that they're not alone in their situation. So the, the international support, they actually know this time, especially because of social media being um, so prevalent uh, in this day and age, they actually are aware that people are watching the situation, they're not alone, and, and that any, um, let's say, human rights violations, serious human rights violations that take place will not go unreported. They're, they're aware that there's, there's backup around the... Uh, the sanctions and stuff, maybe not so much. That doesn't really uh, impact the people on the ground. Um, and of course, Maduro, his way of shoring up the army, uh, the sanctions don't affect that. He's uh, he's rewarding them with generalships. Just to, to see, there's hundreds and hundreds of generals now, uh, and maybe not any uh, not any lower ranks to to deal with any any of the actual work. But he's rewarding them with rank and position. Um, so the sanctions, which would ordinarily uh, allow them to spread cash freely, maybe those are biting there, but that's not really affecting the people. So just point of clarification, I think you meant Colombia, not Cambodia. But anyway, lots of chiefs and uh, not so many Indians. Uh, so Guarda said a couple of days ago, the people of Venezuela, the end of usurpation has arrived. At this moment, I am with the main military units of our armed forces starting the final phase of Operation Liberty. People of Venezuela will go to the street with armed forces to continue taking the streets until we consolidate the end of usurpation, which is already irreversible. What do you make of those fighting words, Mark? Well, as, as you say, they're, they're clearly fighting words. This is a, a situation, um, Guardo's putting uh, his entire future on the line. So if this doesn't work, he's gonna end up like a, is it Lopez, um, who was under house arrest, or worse, his uh, his life is is effectively over if this doesn't pull off. So he, he's going um, balls to the wall uh, in terms of, of trying to get this done. And it, it, I think the people of Venezuela are ready for it. There, there's been so much uh, degradation, deprivation. Um, we've seen what happens with the zoos, the animals being eaten, people sorting through trash to try and get food. This is an oil rich country. It's an oil rich country. The money's there. It's just not being run properly. Um, and it's caused the, the hunger, the, the deaths of, of far too many. Mark, you, you essentially brought up an interesting point. This is a big and bold move by Guardo to convince the military to come over to his side, but could it end ultimately in his arrest? Yes, absolutely. If he doesn't uh, make the, the transition from interim president to sitting president, and now this doesn't mean that he'll carry on in the, in the president position. He's, uh, he's made a lot of noises about uh, he will oversee uh, free and fair elections. But uh, yeah, if this doesn't work for him, then he's either got to, to flee the country or he will almost certainly be arrested or worse. Well, suffice it to say that socialism in Venezuela has been nothing short of a nightmare and the condition of its people and its economy are basically in a total shambles. And yes, we hear day after day from the Democrats in America that socialism is the new frontier. What does Venezuela and the situation there teach us about socialism in the long run, Mark? In the, in the long run, I think we're all pretty clear on it. It, it, it hasn't worked. And uh, despite people saying it hasn't been done right, and if we just did this, well, this is what every successive socialist uh, country says and does. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, Cuba is one of the, the few countries that are openly backing Maduro. Um, that tells you something. It, uh, it's a series of, of not success stories who are backing the socialist plan. And it, it's a worry that it, it's gained such traction both in America and England, 
that the much of the younger generation and some of the older seem to think that socialism is the answer to all of their ills when it's been shown again and again and again that it's not the answer to anything. Thank you so much for doing this today on Truth is Making a Comeback. Mark Angelides, managing editor of LibertyNation.com. Have a great day, Mark. Thanks, Lisa. And now for this week's parting shot. There's a strange phenomenon in this era of global Christian persecution. Those of you who have been darkening the doors of churches for years, perhaps even decades, have probably noticed this. No longer is the church sanctuary an escape from a troubled world. It has become a worrisome reflection of what's going on outside it. Some of us may feel trapped. Some might experience a stab of fear when crossing the threshold into our places of worship. Sadly, people being gunned down in church is nothing new. But one must wonder, was the bloodshed in Sri Lanka a sign of something so broad and deep that it has entered the very psyche of the average churchgoer? And the synagogue shootings in San Diego and Pittsburgh must bring about similar feelings for those of the Jewish faith. This startling realization came to me last Sunday as the Special Needs Handbell Choir, with which I am involved, performed Jesus, my Redeemer, for the congregation. As we made our way below the fellowship hall, there stood a large, somewhat menacing policeman who was armed to the teeth. It was a jarring experience wheeling and walking our kids with disabilities past this officer. It ushered in a whole host of emotions. Heartbreak that the world's violence had made its way into our worship time. And sorrow that Christians are on the hit list of so many. As well as a little bit of trepidation that behind the door to Sunday School Room 102 might be someone lurking with murder in their hearts and the means to carry it out. These emotions spring forth and the mindset of joy, peace, and grace, what you'd expect to have in a place of worship is rudely interrupted, replaced with an urgent desire for self-protection and security. Then the reality of the situation hits. I'm not permitted to carry a firearm in this state or county. If this hasn't occurred to you, rest assured it has crossed the minds of church authorities. Elders, vestries, and church boards of trustees all over America are hiring security guards or paying for local police presence. Some smaller congregations unable to afford such luxuries call on their members with concealed carry permits to lock and load before heading off to worship. I recently served as a women's retreat leader at a Southern church. The pastor lifted his shirt just high enough to reveal his H&K 9mm. Quote, I never preach without it, he asserted. And he isn't alone. He explained that he recruited seven congregants trained in the use of firearms to carry as well. Running late for service? Don't forget the kids, the Bible, and your Glock? It seems odd to say this, but on the other hand, there is something comforting about it. Still, myriad gun laws prohibiting ordinary people from packing heat at church stand in the way. These firearm regulations have turned the average gun-savvy churchgoer into an outlaw. This isn't just unconstitutional, it's obscene and counterproductive for those who wish to defend themselves. Those who attend large churches are especially at risk. Some of America's megachurches make Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School look like a bandbox. Like it or not, firearms have become an important part of the worship experience in the 21st century. If radicals are going to take aim at our places of worship, it would be in our best interest to be armed and dangerous. The goal for these murderers is to kill and maim as many Christians as possible in one fell swoop. And we must be prepared for such encounters. Making it illegal for Americans to carry their firearms wherever and whenever they might need it for protection is, well, downright criminal. And that's my parting shot. And that's it for this edition of Truth is Making a Comeback. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit our website, libertynation.com, where facts matter. Have a great week. Truth is Making a Comeback. Visit us at libertynation.com.